Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Omni Athlete. You're here because, like us, you believe that sport is a vehicle for elevating global consciousness. But you know that elevating consciousness through sport only matters if it actually helps you to achieve a peak performance state, get in the zone, and compete at your highest level. We created this show to highlight the world's highest achieving mind, body, and spirit competitors to unveil for you a side of sports that most never see and rarely know exists. Okay, so today's guest is on an adventure to challenge and question everything that we think we know about sports, education, and development. But his adventure actually started in a small town in the mountains of Wyoming, where the dream of playing basketball at Duke gave him a huge goal to chase as hard as he possibly could. And he did. He even took the ACT five times just so he can get a high enough score to get in. Despite the massive amount of work he put in to get there, once at Duke, he got quiet, pulled back, stopped challenging himself to learn, and eventually fell short of his goal. Even though he was crushed, what happened next is nothing short of incredible and is the very reason why he's become such a sought-after speaker, coach, and storyteller. Starting from his mom's basement, he began a ravenous mission to uncover the truth about how human beings learn and develop across sports and life. What was at first just a blog with a handful of readers has since grown into an absolute powerhouse of a platform where he shares the lessons he synthesizes from the greatest minds in learning, education, and development with his tribe. His powerful message and utterly amazing ability to distill complex concepts into easy to digest and fun to watch, video essays, blogs, workshops, and graphics have allowed him to work with behemoth companies like Microsoft, Chipotle, and Quest Nutrition. In addition to the work he's done with best-selling authors, Olympic coaches, professional athletes, renowned professors, and thousands of coaches, teachers, students, and players from all over the world. It's my pleasure to introduce to Omni Athlete, the Jungle Tiger, and founder of Train Ugly, Trevor Reagan. Welcome to the show, Trevor. Thanks, man. That was like the most epic intro ever. <laughs> <laughs> Try to get the energy moving a little bit, right? Yeah, you did some research. I like it. Yeah, man. I, uh, you know, in doing the research for you, I, I really try to, uh, with these intros, try to give you as our guest a chance to know that your story has at least at some level been told so we can kind of dive a little bit deeper to start. And the question that screams into my head as I was doing the research is to start with mindset, but I actually want to start somewhere different. And I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about emotions around performance and a growth mindset. I think that's a really interesting space. Love it. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. So um, I think the most, I don't want to get too specific yet, but what I'm really curious to, to understand is what have you learned just about the role that emotions play when we really try to assess where our mindset is, right? I, I think for a lot of coaches, and you've talked about this in different videos, right? A lot of coaches, a lot of athletes, the, the hardest part can just be realizing what is my mindset right now? And the emotions that get created in that moment can be tough to, to process. I'm with you. Emotions are tricky because in many ways, we're, in many ways, we're like not, in control of them like fear is an example like we're gonna feel fear uh if we lose a game we're gonna be sad if we're struggling we're like those emotions are kind of human responses to things that happen and so there's like lots of tactics here um maybe the 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 most important one and where i like to start is realizing that emotions aren't really something to battle against or try to get rid of uh, especially like fear and others. And so kind of accepting the fact that it's okay to feel those things. Like it's, it's okay to be disappointed if you lose. It's okay to be afraid before a big moment, big game, big test. And so rather trying, like rather than trying to suppress those or get rid of those or fight those, it's more about accepting them and then going to work on our actions. And what we find is once we start to go to work on the stuff we can control, which are our actions and behaviors, the emotions don't really go away, but they're sort of like less in the front. 
and they're they're not driving our behavior we are driving our behavior and oftentimes that's the place we want to get where i'm not making decisions out of fear that the fear is there but i'm overriding that and doing what i need to do um so again it's not about fighting the emotion or, or removing it it's more about accepting it and sometimes like reappraising it giving it new meaning calling it something else that will help us control what we can control that's our actions do you find that in with the coaches and athletes that you've worked with so what what comes to my mind right there is just language right and and you just kind of called it out what we how we characterize stuff to ourselves is so critical to what we experience in that moment right what we're feeling you know if i um, the, the video you did on fear, right? If I start trying to run from that and I associate fear as this is some, something bad that I'm not supposed to feel, I shouldn't be getting this anxious, this, this level of anxiety, uh, it really changes our response to it. So what are, you know, just both, I guess, the perspective that you've seen and also if there's tactics that you could share too, yeah. like what is the way to build that language so it's truly empowering to us rather than limiting and kind of cutting us out from under? Sure. Like the study you shared yesterday is a good example of reappraisal is what they call it. We call it like reframing and it's just kind of like naming it something else. Um, That's how I think about it. And so the study you talked about, and there's lots like it where rather than saying I'm nervous, you say I'm excited. It's like the feeling doesn't go anywhere. It's just like, I just assigned new meaning. And uh, it's like crazy how powerful that is, especially with performance. Um, if we're going to focus on learning and development, what we try to teach is the skill of reframing everything as an opportunity. Mm -hmm. And that's tough. That's like really easy to talk about and hard to do, but that's powerful of no matter what happens, I'm going to work to reframe this as an opportunity to grow. Um, And that I think is what great learners can do. And so some, some tools that we teach, uh, we like to use like lots of questions of when something happens, maybe three questions to ask, like, what can I learn from this? What's great about this? Like, what would a scientist do? Like, that's how we talk about learning. We learn like scientists, which means if you think about how they approach learning, no matter what happens in the experiment, whether the experiment worked or didn't, in their eyes, it's a great source of feedback. Like, this is teaching me. And so they're really good at the skill of finding opportunities in every situation. And so I think we love to use them as models to teach this process. And so this reappraisal thing, I think, is pretty interesting for learning and performance. Um, I was literally just thinking about one today after I watched your video yesterday. Um, I started wearing like a Fitbit six months ago and so did my girlfriend and I didn't really think much about it, but it like tracks your steps and stuff. And what we realized is like, if we were going to go to the grocery store for my whole life, if we couldn't find a spot by the door, it's like kind of pisses you off. You're like, (laughs) now because we had the stupid Fitbits on, like I kind of liked getting a spot far away because I'm like, oh, good. I can get a few more steps. So it's like, (laughs) I'm walking the same distance. Everything is the same, but wearing the Fitbit, tracking my steps. Now it's not like a pain in the ass to walk. It's like, Oh good. I get more steps. And this started happening in other places. Like at an airport, my gates far away. It's like, Oh good. More steps. (laughs) Right. So it's like, it's kind of interesting that that is an example of this reappraisal. Uh, I'm walking the same amount of steps, but in my head, it has a different meaning. It's like, oh, this is helping me gather more steps and achieve this goal that I have. Kind of interesting to think about how that would make me feel better and enjoy it, where before it's just like, oh my goodness, (laughs) so far away. Um, I think that's an example. Yeah. And you know, what comes to mind is the, the notion of awareness, right? So we, um, this show was really created to kind of pull back the veil on mind, body, spirit, right? And say, you know, within the the realm of sport and and peak performance specifically, how do we help people get into more of that peak state easier, more efficiently? That flow state is really what people are after, at least within our tribe. And what, what we found is that awareness is so critical to anything in performance, right? And I know that maps both against just learning in general, but, but a lot of the work you've done too, if our focus is not on an area that's going to help us grow and produce at a different level, we're just going to be stuck in the same place anyway. Right. Mm -hmm. 
I'm with you, man. And again, all of the stuff that you talk about, all the stuff I talk about, their skills, yeah. which means like no one's perfect with this. Yeah. Like yeah. we have this idea of what we're pursuing and because it's a skill, it means the more that we do it, the better we get. We have to treat more things as skills. And I think the other layer to that is to help people understand like, look, like this isn't something that you're going to just master overnight. Like get the reps, practice this. And like, I've been obsessed with this stuff for years and I'm not perfect with it at all. Like there was a workshop I was doing with like 300 educators and it was like four hours long. We dug into everything. It was going really well. I would say 299 of them were all about it and you could see it in their face. One guy you could tell was not about it and who (laughs) knows why, but he was not into it. And Mm -hmm ideal scenario like right now we can talk about we can have a little armchair courage and be like oh yeah don't worry about the one guy 299 loved it but in the moment i couldn't stop looking at the guy who was not about it um so again like on paper we know what we can do and that that was a time where i let that one guy distract me like did it ruin the workshop no but i definitely it wasn't my a game because he shook me a bit um that night, like thinking about it, I was like, huh, like ideally, what would I have liked to do? One would be to just ignore him. Two would be, what if during a break, I went up and asked him like, hey man, like what could be better about this? Like what would have happened? And so again, it's easy to sit here on Zoom and have lots <laughs> of courage about like, right, right. Do, this, do that, do this. And even in that moment, after being obsessed with this for, for years, I didn't handle it right. Um, so it's just like, I think figuring out what to do on paper, that's not hard, but actually doing it in the moment is really hard. And the more we practice it, the better we get at it. Where did that shift happen for you? So so in doing my research, I got to, to learn a little bit more about your story, but I'm really curious to, to know, so context, right? I walked onto the, the CU football team my freshman year, blew out my hamstring in my trap, right? And, and like like that, it's gone, right? And And I was just, obliterated right and it took so long to to find something that i could grab onto that gave me that same fire and i was fortunate that you know i I had martial arts as something that i'd done all my life but i but i wonder what was that like where did that shift happen for you because it's just it can be such a debilitating moment um if we don't grab something else relatively quickly right or at least process it yeah i mean for me i don't even know if it was a moment i didn't handle mine well at all like (laughs) <laughs> it wasn't like two years down the road. I was like, Oh, I see. This is great. And I can learn. I don't know if that ever happened. I can look back now. That was like 12 or 14 years ago and be like, Oh yeah, for sure. Lots of good stuff happened. But I don't even know if it was because of a conscious thing that I did. Mm. Um, the biggest things for me, one, I think when I fell short of walking onto Duke, it threw me out of my comfort zone to a place where it's like sp- your identity is kind of gone now where for 18 years I was known as like the basketball guy. And that was super comfortable and great. And I stuck with the team. I was a manager for a couple of years, practice player. Uh, But after that, it kind of forced me out of my comfort zone to make friends and look at things outside of the world of sports. Um, And I spent a lot of time out of sports, um, tried to start a business with my friends. We learned a lot of stuff from that, lived in Australia and did some stuff there. And it was just like kind of learning about different arenas. So I spent a lot of time in tech, a lot of time in the startup world. And like those worlds are in many ways, light years ahead of other arenas as far as how they approach learning and development. And I started like learning all these things and they were starting to answer this kind of like underlying question I had had since uh, trying to walk on a dupe, which is what the heck could I have done better? Because I felt like I did it all. Like I was in the gym in the morning during lunch after, like I, I thought I did it. And so a lot of these things I was learning and experiencing started to chip away and answer that question. Um, and after being out of sports for a while, the itch came back of like, all right, I want to get back into like coaching, Mm -hmm. something related to sports. Like that's my passion, but I've learned a lot of other things. And like you said, started a blog, moved back to the U S from Australia, moved into my mom's basement and started 
to just really hammer this blog of like, what are some tactics and principles that people can use to get better? Um, just, I think talking to the right people at the right time was the most important thing. Uh, like John Kessel was like my first interview and he took me under his wing and introduced me to other people and other principles and it, and it snowballed after that. Um, so I think with most things, it's like we're stumbling around. It's hard to pinpoint the actual thing that led to the progress and like all of the upside of a failure. It's, it's more of like an extended messy thing where years later you look back and you're like, oh, I see how those dots connect. There's this notion of like expanding capacities that, and, and where that comes to for me is like, we, we've seen a lot of coaches that are very successful when they step back from sport, right? When they just, and even athletes too, mm -hmm. when they really just say, okay, I need to pull back, whether it's intentional or not, and allow their, you know, their, their brain, their body to process different data, right? From just different perspectives where there isn't this kind of same tint of it only works if it's this way, right? I only practice right. this way. I only run this way. I, like, mm -hmm. you know, the first time an athlete's exposed to yoga, the first time they're exposed to meditation. And, and it just, the moment that we can see that the world's a little bit bigger, it yeah. seems like it just blows the roof off a lot of what those old belief systems might be. I'm with you. I think that understanding that we can steal and share between all these arenas is powerful that <clears throat> if if our focus is to improve athletes and coaching and sports, good, but we should be looking into tech and education and art because it's like people are solving similar problems and coming to like different conclusions and we can share between the three or four arenas. And this is something that I see in the workshops that when I started these workshops, it was mostly sports teams. And now it's grown to be companies, sports teams, worked in prisons, worked with like literally any group you could imagine. And the funny thing is we're teaching the exact same principles every time. We might package it differently, but you're getting to the like same punchline. And to me, that's fascinating of like, this, the, these are human things that no matter what arena we operate in, we all have fear, we all have stories, we all experience these emotions and pain when we struggle and fail, that the tactics that we would teach maybe a third grader are the same ones we covered with Microsoft. That blows my mind. <laughs> um, but it's cool to share between the three, like uh, in the tech world, the lean startup movement, like it, it, it's, it's like the way that people start a company now. Most people in education and sports would benefit from understanding what the lean startup methodology is because it's basically like, look, you're going to struggle and fail. Try to do that quickly. Nice. Learn as much as you can up front before you invest too much time and money in a project. It's like everyone can benefit from that. <laughs> Let's look into these different arenas at the things they're figuring out and then share between the others. This notion, right? I, I know you're a fan too of Cal Newport's book, right? So good they can't ignore you. And and this notion of building up career capital within the athletic sphere is really fascinating, right? So I think you know we we've had guests on before, and I'm sure you dealt with this. I remember as as a player, me too. Like I wanted to play more than I was playing my first year, right? Like I just wanted to, and it it would have been such a just honestly counterintuitive thing for me to think, wow, maybe there's a benefit to just getting better at what I have right in front of me and trying to, to hold on to this notion of I can build up skills that will be valuable for me later. I don't know if that maps perfectly to a 16 year old kid, but I think there's this, there's this culture around how can we get really, really good and love that process over simply how much playing time I got or how many followers I have or whatever the case may be. It's tough to get caught up in the outcome for sure, because oh, man, outcomes are slippery. So it's like, Maybe dream scenario, we just remove that, don't care about it. We don't like really have those big outcome centric goals, but in the real world, probably not gonna happen because like <laughs> outcomes matter in literally everything we do. So <laughs> rather than just trying to ignore that, we kind of teach more of like the tightrope walk of, yeah, I care about the outcome. I wanna make the team. I wanna play well. I wanna get more playing time, but okay, cool. Are we down to earn that though? And that's what really matters. So it's like the tightrope of, I care about the outcome, but I'm invested in the process, the growth, the opportunities. And that's where our model of learning like a scientist comes in. That's what they do. Yeah. They don't just go to the lab and say, let's just learn things. It's like <laughs> they have a, a pursuit, a vision, an outcome, a goal that matters. It's different for each one, 
they have that. And then they invest in the experiments to like pursue that outcome. And I like that approach. Yeah. And, and I think when you, when you bring up the notion of scientists to a room full of coaches, does that help bridge some of the gap potentially between the, the techniques, the principles that you're trying to teach and what they may look at and say, well, I've done it this way all, all my life. Why would I need to do anything different? I, I think it's great. And I'm a firm believer in sort of like sneaking up um, yeah. on people with principles. Yeah. So like yeah. if you come out of the gate, like, listen, the way you think about learning is way wrong. <laughs> and you need to change. It's like, nah, you can't attack people. Like as soon as people feel that threat, they're, they're not going to learn. They're not going to listen. And so we kind of take a backdoor approach where we present this idea of like, Learning like a scientist. Okay, how do scientists learn? Uh, well, they're trying to achieve big goals. How do they achieve the goal? Boom, boom, boom. We talk a lot about Elon Musk and SpaceX. Like, they're a great example. They're trying to make reusable rockets. Okay, we show videos and take people through that. Um, and that's the same as what Jungle Tiger Zoo Tiger is as well. So, like, it's a way of getting people bought into the principles. And then you take it to their world and, like, okay, how do we Jungle Tiger here? So, Every workshop I've ever done starts with the Jungle Tiger Zoo Tiger. Literally every person ever to hear it agrees, yes, the Jungle Tiger would be better prepared to survive in the wild than a tiger that grew up in the zoo. And that goes, kindergartners would be on board with that. Everyone's on board with that. Cool. <laughs> that punchline, that principle should influence the way we learn. Because we get to choose to jungle and zoo tiger multiple times a day. So if on paper we are on board with, yes, this jungle tiger is going to learn more because it faces more challenges and has to struggle and kind of fend for itself than a tiger that lives in a zoo, cool, then let's stop learning like zoo tigers and let's stop choosing the zoo tiger all the time. Are we going to be perfect with that? Absolutely not. But to just take it back to your question, this is our sort of approach of we get people bought in with stories and examples, and then you kind of work to this point where they're like, oh, I can do this here. Like, rather than like coming out of the gate attack mode, um, I, I like that approach to teaching a little better. So I have like three questions that just jumped into my head. I'm gonna to try to distill here a little bit. So, so one of the questions, stories right and and just the way that we assimilate meaning as human beings right it tends to happen through story through narrative a lot of times and i think um the notion of how that can influence culture of sports at large right so we have a lot of narratives within sport that are not all intentionally pushing against the notion of a growth mindset but there are there are a lot of it within sports that is pushing as this is how we do it we've done it this way forever you need to focus on these things and if you don't you're weird you're crazy you shouldn't be here anyway right and and i wonder if you've seen stories or just examples of of athletes that have really said there's a different process that i'm going to go through and and not uh, uh from an outcome versus process perspective but like just different stories that we can celebrate, right? Because as kids, when you grow up and the person you idolize is somebody that starts talking with a blatant fixed mindset now, when you reflect on that, you're like, oh man, okay, what, what can we do to foster a different kind of narrative within sport? I'm with you. I think let's, there's like, when we say stories, there's different meaning there. So sure. I believe in storytelling to teach a concept. Mm -hmm. uh, in our workshops and on our website and in our videos, there's another type of stories and stories to me are like fixed mindset beliefs of, I can't learn that. We don't need to learn that. I can't do that. Stuff like that. Those are stories too. I'm not a math person. I'm not a leader. These stories absolutely get in the way. And sometimes role models and watching people that we really idolize can be a source of stories mm -hmm. because we only see what's on the surface and we only see what people really say. Right. And so sometimes what they're saying isn't even actually what is going on backstage. And so it can get messy and it can get confusing that if you were to watch like LeBron play, the announcers would call him gifted like 500 times a half. Oh, sure, sure. Uh, he's not gifted this could give us the wrong perception of learning. He's 6'8", 250, that doesn't hurt. So we can agree, right. the natural stuff, great. 
But there's lots of people that are 6'8", 250 that aren't LeBron. So he earned and developed those skills. To call him gifted, I think, does no justice to the grind and process he went through to earn that. And it gives us the wrong idea that great performers, great learners, the people that we see, lots and lots and lots of practice went into that. I think this story of people are gifted takes a lot of the blame off our shoulders. So it's a fun one to tell. Yeah. It's so much easier to say, I'm not a math person because I didn't receive that gift for one reason or the other. When the truth is we're probably not good at math because we haven't spent the time to build that skill. So the story takes a little ownership off of our shoulders, a little blame off of us. But if we're going to live according to what a lot of the science says about learning, that skills are something that we are in control of, that we do build, then that gives us a little more ownership. To me, though, that should be empowering mm. like, to, yeah. to be like, OK, cool. Like maybe I don't have some physical gifts. Like the truth is I'm five, eight and a half. That made playing basketball for Duke really hard. <laughs> that if I was six, three, I probably made the team. Yeah. But that doesn't mean I can't get good at basketball. Like that's, I think, finding ways to, le- to get the stories out of the way and then pursue things anyways is important. And I think sports are tough because there are some physical things that are going to help a ton. Sure. But learning in general, it's like most of the other things in life that we learn aren't capped with like our height and agility and stuff like that. So it should be empowering of like, huh, like what could I learn that would help me the most in my career? And now let me go get to work on that skill. That's kind of like under that Cal Newport approach of like, okay, what are the things that could make me dangerous here? And let me go earn those skills. There's such a, you know, this notion of ego, right? We, we want so often to protect ourselves from any feedback that is going to, and this is, you know, fixed mindset as well, right? Crack any holes in that armor that we've built around what our identity is and what we, you know, think we're capable of doing. And you're right. You know, we, we have this, this idea here that peak performance is a choice, right? That we, that we can make that choice to, to develop the skills necessary to put ourselves in the right state, to build the environment, our community, our tribe in the right way to allow us step into that place. And, more often than not, our ego is going to be that piece of us that says, I want to make it somebody else's fault that this didn't happen. I want to make it somebody else's responsibility that I didn't hit that. And it just, you know, it, it can be a, sure, you know, just an, a, an ugly moment, pun not intended, to have to stare yourself in the mirror and recognize that, right? Mm-hmm. I think it goes back, you can even use the tactics we talked about at the start of reappraisal reframing. So our default response the human response to feedback more times than not is an attack if someone's telling me something they're attacking me if we reappraise reframe that as this information might be hurtful but it will help me going back to learning like a scientist they want feedback because they want their experiment to go well and achieve this goal so they're more receptive to feedback not because they're changing the things people say to them nah we don't change our environment can do is start to reframe the meaning of the stuff people are saying to us. So if someone comes to me and is like, look, um, watch your workshop. I just don't think public speaking is like, is your thing. You're not a very good speaker. It would be so easy to adopt that story. And I adopted lots of those stories in my time. I'm just not cut out to be a speaker, a leader, a math person. So, okay, how do we reframe that? We say, look, for some reason or the other, they thought this talk didn't go well. Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong, but let me look at it. First, I need to understand speaking, teaching is a skill. So even if I'm not very good at it now, it's a skill I can build, cool. Um, Let's look at, well, going back to the scientists, why did the rocket crash? Why did this talk not go well? Um, For some reason, I didn't engage with the audience. How can I fix that? Uh, maybe we didn't have enough time to dig into all the examples. And so they didn't see like the full message. How do I fix that? Um, so again, it's just kind of going back to like, I'm a scientist here. Like we're in the lab. Everything we do is an opportunity to grow. All the things people say to us can be opportunities. Now, again, there's a time, there's 
some things people say that are just blatant attacks. Mm -hmm. Like there's some comments on our YouTube videos. It's just like, yeah, there's really no nugget of wisdom there. Just like, sorry, <laughs> basically like you suck at everything and you should delete your <laughs> channel. It's like, I don't know if there's an opportunity to grow in that. And so sometimes like Brene Brown talks a lot about this. She's like, if you're not in the arena with me, like, going to battle in the trenches trying to grow it's like your feedback really doesn't matter to me so i think that's helpful as well it's like look is this person even in a place where this is valuable information if yes let me listen let me try to like find the nugget and find the opportunity and try not to take it personally uh once again just like all of this easy to say hard to do so we we talk a lot about taking things seriously not personally that's helped me a ton so Again, I'm not perfect with that either, but reframing reappraisal, I think is a powerful tool in a lot of these conversations that we're having. I think so too. And, and the, the thing that that's just, uh, that's really energizing as we talk to is, is you've got principles, right? Like there is a, I can feel as you're processing, right? There's a, there's a handful of principles that almost like those, uh, that Pachinko machine, right? Where you drop a ball and it just kind of go and drops through. Like I can feel different pieces where it's like, okay, did I grab that? No, this fits here. Okay. Let's, let's drop down this hole. And I wonder that that's super energizing dude, because I feel like so many people walk through life without a philosophy at all, let alone having consistent principles that they can grab. Do sure. you, for, as an athlete, where do you go to start building those principles? Like where, forget, you know, the, the notion of I'm, I'm going to be, um, you know, whatever my coach says, I'm going to, I'm going to live that hundred percent, but really taking the ownership of what is it that I believe mm -hmm. as the athlete, where do we start? Ooh. So I don't know. I, I don't know if I can tell other people how to do it. Here's what I think about it. This is how I think about if I'm going to learn something new, these are maybe this would be the, the layers that I think about one to get good at this. It's going to take some time. And it's going to take some reps. And the, those reps, if they stretch me out of my comfort zone, are going to be better reps than the ones that don't. Getting out of my comfort zone, jungle tigering is messy. And there are two reasons I'm going to resist that. My stories of, I can't do this. I can't learn this. And my fear of, I'm about to look bad and I don't like to look bad. <laughs> so those are the two reasons that I probably won't get into those jungle tiger reps. Okay. I overcome my stories with the belief that I can learn. That's where growth mindset comes in. Growth mindset and jungle tigering are not the same thing. Jungle tigering is the act of getting out of my comfort zone and growth mindset is an important piece of that process. Yeah. So the belief that I can learn is going to help me jungle tiger more. Fear is a whole different beast. This fear of looking bad and the fear of the unknown keeps me in my comfort zone. Uh, in our videos and the way we talk about fear, it's like not something to get rid of. It's something to accept and just understand, oh, it's totally normal to feel that fear. So when we dance with that fear and understand that it's okay, that is likely going to lead to more jungle tiring. Cool. So where I'm at is, I need to find a way to jungle tiger and spend as much time out of the comfort zone as I can. Now there's a certain level to that. I don't need to like go way out where it's way too hard. I'm not going to learn anything, but it's like that magic space right at the edge of my abilities. How do I spend more time there? So let's go back to the first talk I ever gave in my life was about three and a half years ago. And I did what Annie wanted to do. I had like a month to prepare and I started doing lots of work in front of the mirror. And I had like my notes here and I was really good in front of the mirror. And it was kind of comfortable and easy because I had my notes, I could memorize it. I wasn't getting any facial feedback. I, like it was pretty chill. And what I realized is like, this is very, very in my comfort zone. Like this is how everyone prepares for a talk but it's kind of zoo tigery right now. <laughs> like it's easy. It's, it's super comfortable. Yeah. And so with like three weeks leading up, I decided I, I can't give any more talks in front of the mirror. I either have to stream them live on YouTube or convince people to come sit in my li living room and listen. And like doing that sucks. <laughs> like it's not fun, but I found like those reps 
because I was getting feedback, whether in the YouTube comments or from my girlfriend's parents who don't barely even knew me at the time. It's like, that's uncomfortable, but I'm getting better feedback now. And I'm practicing sort of more like a jungle tiger. This is more like the actual talk I'm going to give. Right. More of the variables were present. So building off of that, um, after the first couple talks, I realized like, wow, this is like, this is a whole area to what I do that I didn't even know exists. This mm. hitting the road, giving a workshop and connecting and teaching in person. And so I was like, how can I get good at this? And what I realized is <clears throat> we had been running some basketball camps in the summer and we usually back then did about nine or 10 camps a summer. And each one was like five days long and each one was four groups a day. So it'd be like uh, middle school girls, middle school boys, high school girls, high school boys. And in the past, we just did basketball stuff. And I was like, hold up. We need to be teaching this mindset stuff in the camp as well. It's not just about basketball. So we started building in like 25, 30 minute sessions at the end of each group where we would like sit and talk about these principles. Number one, the kids loved it. But number two, I realized this is the best all time sort of petri dish to experiment with these talks so again looking back it, it was unreal how powerful that was didn't even realize it at the time but i would have to give say the topic was fear i'd have to give that four times that day with four different groups so constant learning opportunities we could literally fix it on the fly getting feedback from the people there and then the even better part is the next week on Tuesday, I have to do the same one to four different groups. And what I found is coming out of the summer after the camps, it's like, yo, these workshops have been tested in a very jungle tiger like environment. It's like, yo, try to teach a seventh grader about neuroplasticity. Let's see what you got. <laughs> and like, I'll admit most of them flopped for sure. <laughs> but coming out of the summer, it's like that's when the workshops really picked up steam. Not because we spent a lot of time brainstorming them um, or working in front of a mirror. It's because we had a sickening amount of reps yeah. in a very game-like jungle tiger environment. That's why we got good at teaching this. So the comfort zone, right? Like uh, th there's the two things that come to mind. One real quick did did that notion of jungle tiger zoo tiger did that come from those moments where you're like if i have to condense neuroplasticity the the uh, just everything that happens in our brain which is infinitely complex into something that a, you know a sixth grader can understand yeah it's going to be amazing to somebody who's 40 years old they're going to get it instantly is that where some of it came from that's where all of it came from yeah, yeah, yeah literally no. literally yeah. i remember when it happened like jungle tiger wasn't like this huge thing we worked on. It was my yeah. brother and I were doing a camp. We were working with this team that had been very successful in high school basketball and they had a lot of good players. And a big part of our camp, the premise is we want you to struggle a bit. And so like there's this kid who he's like a foot taller than everyone and he would just get rebounds and putbacks mm -hmm. and we would play lots of one-on-one -on -one, and he'd just dominate. And then we made a rule like, okay, uh, it's one shot one-on-one. -on -one. So if you miss, it's just the other guy's ball. And he was getting crushed, but it was good because like yeah. now he had to like kind of develop more aspects of his game. He walked out of the gym. Wow. Because he couldn't handle it. He's like so used to just dominating yeah. everyone. Yeah. He walks out of the gym. We gave him a refund. It's the only player ever to quit our camp. <laughs> but he left. And at the end, during the workshop session, we had something we wanted to talk about, but the team was just there. And their mascot were tigers. And so we just started, it just kind of like came organically of like talking about different tigers and it just grew in that little conversation. Um, the jungle tiger was born and it, we kind of worked it through with the team. And then the crazy thing is like, this is the framework that everything is based off of now. Jungle tiger, zoo tiger, that explains the learning process. That explains motor learning. Like Again, we didn't know it at the time, but I think it's like the, a great foundation to have conversations about learning. Because if you look at the neuroplasticity, if you study deliberate practice or deep practice, yeah. all of it is saying, hey, we need to find that place right at the edge of our yeah. ability. 
Well, and, and it's just so funny because it gets back to that, that adage, right? Like we, as grownups, we're just giant kids, right? Like we are literally just giant kids. And so for us, I, I think so much, you know, we, we, uh, 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 I would say a fair amount of our tribe is really, really high level recreational athletes, right? So they're, they're past the point where they're playing in college or, or even some of them are still competing professionally, but we hit this point in life where as adults, our belief system becomes so rigid, right? That uh-huh. we just, we do, we, we have, we have challenge with bringing into that belief system ideas and stories that are going to go against it. And so the notion of jungle tiger, zoo tiger, right? That's, that's so amazing because it's easy and it's not about my belief system. It's just about a tiger. And I can kind of almost, (laughs) I can almost disassociate for a moment and say, Oh, that's interesting, but it gets into my system. I think it's absolutely amazing. Yeah. I think I was just talking uh, last week with a group and it was like an eight hour thing. So we had lots of time for discussion and to, to digest. And like, by the end of the day, and I, one of them, one of the people said it, and I agree, it's like, most of this stuff is a reminder. Most of this stuff, and I haven't invented any of this. There's people writing about this in the year one. Like, like <laughs> it's like the science is starting to prove some of these principles now. But none of these things are just like so out of the box. Most of it is a reminder. And we've done most of these things on our own quite a bit. Maybe our message and your message is we're just trying to help people do that a little more or remind them that like there's no expiration date on this, that we can like sort of do this on purpose more often. Like why do we have to stop practicing? I was just thinking about it yesterday. Like as adults, most of us stop practicing. The ones that do practice, artists, athletes, and musicians, they continue to practice. But most of us kind of just start doing our thing. Yeah. What if there was more time invested to practicing? And, and obviously we have some limitations on our time, but I think it's something that like, again, in Cal Newport's book, he talked a lot about that. How can I actually practice a little bit more? Um, and again, that's something we grow up doing and then we kind of stop. There's a, there's self-honesty to it, right? So like there's mm-hmm. this, um, you know, I, we see so many athletes and I, I think coaches too, to a certain extent, because as coaches, a lot of times we try to kind of separate, I think, unintentionally the love that we have for something from what we're doing in that moment, right? So we, mm-hmm. we develop this kind of disassociation with if I love practicing, if I really find ways to get myself into the middle of this and experiment and grow as much as I can, I'm going to get better. We kind of pull back and say it's all about my team, my athletes. And it's it's just really interesting to, to see we really have to, to be aware and honest about what's important to us and be able to put that first thing first, right? And, and I think there's so much value in that. So the, the, the best example of this that I've seen is uh, the USA women's volleyball staff. Um, when I was hanging out with them, it was like Tom Black, Jamie Morris, and Karch Karai. And, and they had a, a lot of other people as well. But they're the three that I spent the most time with um, and Joe Trinzi. And the way I saw them approach that was such a great model of this, that the conversations they had with those women on their team was like, look, we're in the trenches with you. We expect you to come here and get better every day, but we are here trying to get better every day. We're going to experiment with the drills, with the the practice plan. We're going to experiment with the way we give feedback. We're going to experiment with the way we even explain a drill. So this constant experimentation and learning I think is powerful for a few reasons. One, it gives the signal to the team that I am in the trenches with you. I'm here trying to get better. And when we pick up on that signal that everyone's here, it becomes a safer place to struggle and try new things. Great. Number two, it helps them get better. (laughs) So like they're going to get much better as a coach as treating it like a scientist and that we're in the lab and we're running experiments than if they just kind of roll back and say, this is how we always do it. So one, it's going to pr- provide a better environment for everyone there, safer place to learn. Two, we are going to get better. <laughs> and it just, I think, is an ultimate example of one of the best ways to teach us to other people is to walk the walk yourself. Mm. That like we talked about this like sideline courage, like one of the easiest things to do is tell other people what to do and tell other people to get out of their comfort zone and tell other people that they should dance with fear and tell other people that when you're in a high pressure situation, just treat it as an opportunity. Like, <laughs> it's a little harder, but I think more effective to walk that walk. And I think 
Karch and his staff is they're such a great example of this. Um, that, finding ways to grow all the time. Yeah, and and the ability to provide and empower your team through that idea of safety, right? So we, you know, one of our guests, one of our first guests, um, was a, a rowing coach and Olympian, Jason Dorland, and one of his principal philosophies is love, right? Love will win every single time. And if we make mm -hmm. sure that our players know that we're going to love them regardless of whether they perform at their best or have an awful game, right? That's that's love this it. kind of foundational level of, of just – environment and safety they have to have and mm -hmm. i've seen you allude to similar ideas that we just we have to model and show these things as coaches and as athletes sure. you know we almost have to demand that that's the kind of environment that we're going to step into mm -hmm. i'm with you man I, like there's just like a coach or a leader or a parent anyone for them to just kind of like be vulnerable and share fear or share whatever it just does so much for the group there's so much value in saying like, look, this is a big game. I'm freaking out a bit. Yeah. And I know you are too, but like, that's why we love sports because of the unknown and because of this tension. It's why we like to watch sports. It's why we like to compete. That if we knew we're going to win every game, we don't like sports anymore. So the price of admission is that feeling. And I have it right now. And I know you do too. Let's go kind of enjoy that and let it rip because that is why we love this so much. I just shared that I was afraid and most coaches, most leaders would never do that. I'm not saying I'm really good at that, but I have seen incredible coaches have those type of conversations. Mm. And so that's what Dan Coyle's new book, Culture Code, is kind of about that. One of the, the, like the three most important things we can see in a culture, safety, shared vulnerability, and shared purpose. That that little conversation that we just had, like, I shared my vulnerability. I'm kind of afraid right now. That creates a safe environment. Our people are more likely to go let it rip. We're more likely to perform better. Not because I told them to, to not be afraid. Not because I hid my fear and acted like I'm just chill right now because I'm not. It's like shared vulnerability can build safety. It's really, really scary to share your vulnerability, though. It, it is, and even more so in an environment where we're, we're so often brought up to, to not just repress, but like to run away from it, right? So like there, there's so mm -hmm. much within, geez, you know, if, within sport, I remember so many moments, what's coming in my head right now, I remember so many moments of my, my teammates crying after games, right? Well, losing games, right? And crying and this just really raw emotion, but we don't talk about necessarily, and we didn't at the time the feelings as much. We didn't talk about right. this is, this is how I'm feeling right now. This is why this thing is happening. And instead we just kind of let it happen and then just walked away. Right. It's right. just a really interesting cycle. Uh, I, I like think it, I remember like in high school, we like lost the game to like go to state when I was like a sophomore and we were all crying and no one, just like you, we didn't talk about it, but like I would argue that most of the people that were crying, it wasn't because like, I'm like mad that we lost or like I didn't play well. It's I'm going to miss this. Yeah. Exactly. Like that's why we were crying. It's like, this has been so fun. I like love you guys. And I like, I don't want to have to wait. 10 months before we do this again. That's, I think, why most people were, that's why I was crying. Yeah. Imagine if we would have shared that. Right. Because, like, who knows? We, we see people crying. It's like, yeah, we're sad, we're disappointed, but, like, what, why? And that would have brought people together. Like, that would have been an amazing conversation. Yeah. It's, it's just challenging to, to be able to... I, I maybe not challenging is the right word, but it's it's necessary, right, to be able to create that space for both for athletes, just as human beings, right? All of us as human beings to be able to have that space to step into. Before I get to my last question, where can these guys find you online? Uh, trainugly.com. That's the platform. Um, that's where we put every video, every article. My contact info is there. I think that's the best place to go. And I think if people are interested in anything we talked about. There's lots of more, like we can expand on these principles and trainugly.com is where we do that. Awesome. Awesome. Okay. So our final question, uh, this show is called Omni Athlete because we want to understand what it takes to be a mind, body, and spirit competitor. So what does it mean to you to be an Omni Athlete? I think, wow, there's like so much we could touch on, but <laughs> to me, when I talk with athletes, I always end 
with this that it's very important to zoom out and appreciate how lucky we are to even be athletes. Not many people get to do that. And to be more specific, the things we experience as athletes are so rare. And in many other arenas in life, we never even touch what it's like to be an athlete. That, like this idea of performing in front of a crowd with your sort of team and friends and family, like that doesn't really happen in other arenas. And and having like a rivalry and having someone's back and like really putting yourself out there in front of an audience where there's so much tension, it's like we could probably list a thousand things athletes get to do and experience that maybe other people don't really get a taste of. Of course, there's other things we can do in life that are great, but sports is a valuable opportunity. And I think a really powerful conversation to have with athletes is those experiences, number one, are valuable in the moment, but they're 10 times more valuable down the road. The athletes in the workplace are great at working with teams. They're great at dealing with adversity because we get all these reps of doing that, doing that, doing that, no matter what level of sport we play. And I think that reminding athletes of that and having those type of conversations is powerful that those lessons and experiences are there regardless of what the scoreboard says of course we're competitors we're trying to win we want to win games and score a lot of points but those lessons are there whether or not we win and we can appreciate that and talk about that and that's been a cool conversation we've had with some uh, athletes of all ages and kind of zooming out and appreciating like we are very lucky to get to do this and let's invest in that and appreciate it as we go through it. Not saying the journey is easy or always fun, but we can always appreciate that there's lots and lots of opportunities to grow that are going to be amazing down the road and in the moment. Wow. Yeah. Gratitude. Holy cow, Trevor. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for being on the show too. This is, uh, so guys, first and foremost, take a moment. It takes literally 30 seconds. Go to trainugly.com and just digest. Like literally the thing you're going to understand when you get there or, or just experience. There is so much content that Trevor and his team have put together to, to just make every bit of research and just the, the painful hours that he has put into learning this stuff easy to digest. And so much of what we do as athletes is ugly, right? It is frustrating. It's challenging. It's hard. And when it comes to bringing even the spirituality into sport, that is ugly. It's hard. It's challenging. We don't know what it's going to look like. And if you go learn from somebody like Trevor, you're going to recognize just we can do it, right? It's skills. It's just a matter of process and understanding what you're trying to do. And I cannot recommend highly enough diving into Trevor's world and learning as much as you can from the free content he's invested so much time in putting out there just to push sport and culture and people forward. Thanks guys, until next time. What is up Omni Athletes? Thank you guys for watching another episode of Omni Athletes. If this content is adding value to your lives, guys, please like and share and subscribe in every way you can. Share our content that helps us grow this community, which is really ultimately what we are after right now. So please like, comment, share, tell your friends about what we're doing. If it's adding value, please share it. And if it's not, tell us so we can really improve this content to make sure it's something that you guys want and want to see. Coming up, guys, in July, I'm super excited to announce we have the 2018 Sports Energy and Consciousness Festival. It's going to be in San Rafael, California. This is an absolutely incredible event for a lot of reasons. The main one being you get to actually engage with so many of the people that we've had on the show, so many of the leaders in sports, energy, and consciousness. The speakers are absolutely incredible, and the community is even more incredible. So I cannot encourage you guys enough. Get to this festival. It is going to be an experience that transforms your vision of athletics, your ability to achieve peak performance, to find flow, to awaken an expanded level of consciousness in your performance that you just cannot find anywhere else. It's truly the tip of the iceberg, and you guys want to be part of it. July 13th through 15th in San Rafael, California. Go to sportsenergyfestival.com to get your tickets today before they run out. It's going to go quick, guys. Get there. Sportsenergyfestival.com, July 13th through 15th. We'll see you there.